The year marches on and the scientific discoveries this year have been so numerous as to make it difficult to keep up with it all. So here are 10 interesting new scientific discoveries for April of 2025. Number 10. The Most Volcanic Exoplanet Seen So Far The solar system's terrestrial worlds and some of its moons show ample evidence of past and even current volcanic activity. There are the icy cryovolcanoes of the outer solar system, but also the volcanically shaped moon, and even current volcanism on Earth, potentially Venus, perhaps at Mars in some form, and of course wildly volcanic Io at Jupiter. But the reasons for volcanism in the solar system's planets is very straightforward, and was always believed to be something we eventually would commonly see in the universe. This has turned out to be the case, and a new candidate planet for volcanism has been discovered using the James Webb Space Telescope. This exoplanet is known as 98-95b and is a rocky planet about half the mass of Earth. JWST has shown that this planet has an atmosphere made up almost entirely of sulfur dioxide, which is a strong indicator of very active volcanism. To see this much sulfur dioxide is unprecedented and would make this small world eight times more volcanic than Io. And there is something else here. This is yet another exoplanet with an atmosphere orbiting a red dwarf. Here this would not be the original atmosphere. This planet is so close in to the red dwarf, what's probably happening is a lot of tidal flexing, contributing a lot of heat energy to the volcanism, the same process that keeps it active. This would mean that the volcanoes are constantly replenishing the atmosphere as it's stripped away by the red dwarf. But it does go to show that situational atmospheres can occur around red dwarfs, and that not all, at least, strip all atmospheres successfully from their inner planets. Number 9. Pompeii Switched Measurement Systems Pompeii is two things. A record of a horrible day in 79 AD when Mount Vesuvius exploded and froze it in time. But in another sense, it also froze the history of the town before the eruption and what it would have been like in periods before the Roman Empire. And in this case, Pompeii revealed an age-old wrestling match, not unlike today, with a few countries still using imperial measurements and most of the rest of the world using metric. Personally, I'm glad I know both. I am not monolingual in my measurement systems, which means I know the strong points and shortfalls of both. That said, Pompeii shows evidence of a shift in standards on measurement. Pompeii was actually a significantly older city and was not originally founded by the Romans. It was founded by the Samnites. The Samnites were an Italic people who lived in the area of Italy corresponding to modern-day Abruzzo and surrounding areas in south-central Italy. They spoke an extinct language, though echoes of that language are still present in some local dialects in the region. Pompeii actually retained this Samnite character up until the end. It actually differs architecturally and artistically from Rome of the period, at least in some ways. The Samnites eventually found themselves at war with the Romans and were absorbed. Pompeii fell in 89 BC. But not entirely as far as culture by the time of the eruption, except in one glaring regard. Pompeii is built on two separate measurement systems. One thing that happened rather dramatically apparently was the city's trade patterns shifted. This is very likely due to local business people shifting focus on the Roman Republic's already vast trade network. This happened decades before the time of Julius Caesar and the beginnings of the imperial system, though the empire had already started. One difference is in the streets and the wear patterns of the ruts from the carts. The Samnite ruts measure differently than the later Roman ruts, and they correlate to the trade pattern shift under the Romans towards the Sarno River, and thus the Roman trade networks. Why were carts standardized back then as far as wheel spacing? The answer probably has to do with the character of the roads themselves. Standardized pacing allowed for efficient use, especially in roads with pre-existing ruts, and reduced damage and wear and tear. This may also in turn have influenced how roads were built in the first place. We still do things like this today, worldwide, with trains, cars, etc. But our modern world did not invent standards, weights, and measures. We inherited the whole idea, though the details vary greatly throughout history and across many cultures. Number 8. Mouse First Aid 
We know that some animals will come to the aid of distressed members of their species. A good example here are dolphins, which have been observed to try to push incapacitated pod mates to the surface so they can breathe, and indeed reports of dolphins aiding humans in distress. But surprisingly, this behavior also seems to be present to some degree in mice. Researchers at the University of Southern California noticed that when mice were anesthetized temporarily, more often than not, cage mates would notice and try to attend to the incapacitated mouse by grooming, tugging at the mouth, and other behavior, but most notably by manipulating the incapacitated mouse's tongue out of the way, presumably to clear the animal's airways. When the mouse woke up, this behavior ceased in the other mice, and they continued on about their business. It's only been observed in the lab, but it does seem to amount to some kind of very basic first aid as an act of clearing an airway. Number 7. The Large Magellanic Cloud is Shooting Stars at Us There is a list of nine enigmatic stars that are within the Milky Way, but do not appear to have originated here based on their motion. These stars seem to hint at an origin in the Large Magellanic Cloud, a dwarf galaxy orbiting the Milky Way. The stars are known as hypervelocity stars, which are stars traveling above 500 kilometers a second, which is about twice the speed of the orbit of the Sun around the galaxy's center. Some of them, however, have an upper limit of 2,000 kilometers per second, or 0.6% the speed of light. There is only one way to accelerate a star to speeds like that, and its interaction with a supermassive black hole somewhere within the Large Magellanic Cloud. We know of such stars having been flung to speeds like this by the supermassive black hole at the center of the Milky Way, but not the Large Magellanic Cloud until now. There have been hints at supermassive black holes in dwarf galaxies, and the Large Magellanic Cloud isn't that small, it's a tenth the size of the Milky Way. But this is the best indicator yet, that if confirmed, dwarf galaxies can have giant black holes at their centers. This black hole may actually be detectable by other means, such as stars orbiting it, which confirm its existence. Number 6. Megalodon Sharks Used Their Jaws For Fighting Megalodon shark teeth are among the most popular fossils out there for collectors, and fire the imagination of the largest shark species to have ever lived. Interestingly, these sharks have been reclassified over the years. Originally thought to be relatives of the great white shark, they are actually closer to what is known as a mackerel shark, and the species name is now Odotus megalodon. They lived during the Miocene and Pliocene, about 23 to 3.6 million years ago, and remain one of the most powerful predators to have ever lived. But there are a lot of uncertainties about this shark because so little remains have been found other than the teeth, which is the only part of a shark that readily fossilizes. Even still, there are other fragmentary remains, though their actual length remains largely unconstrained, somewhere between 47 and 80 feet long. Big either way. Studying a group of four teeth from fossil sites in the Carolinas, the researchers noticed parallel scratch marks that are sometimes perpendicular to its length, eliminating that the shark somehow scratched its own teeth while hunting. This seems to suggest either fighting between members of the species, or members of the species preying on the carrion of other megalodons. This may yield clues about their behavior, but interestingly, bite marks from megalodon sharks have also been found on prehistoric sperm whale teeth. Again, it's unknown if the sperm whales were carrion or if they were attacked. All we know is that sharks of today both hunt and also eat carrion. Perhaps it was that way for the megalodons as well. Number 5. Insight on the Weird Meteorites Our meteorite collections are odd. Most of them are from asteroids, some are from comets, and some are from planets, but that profile changes over time. We have certain meteorites, for example, that fell millions of years ago, and through various means preserved that we do not see fresh examples of falling now. There are also anomalous meteorites that do not fit into any of our classifications, and one such meteorite is NWA 15915, which was found somewhere in the deserts of North Africa. This meteorite is weird in that it looks like it formed in an airless planetary environment, very much like Mercury but it does not match Mercury's composition. 
Also present were large crystals which form only when a parent body cools slowly, which Mercury did. There was also another meteorite known as Galane 022 that also showed similar properties, but the magnetic profile was wrong. The best explanation right now is that these meteorites originated from one or two separate Mercury-sized planets that once existed in the early solar system and are now simply gone. Oddly, there is yet another anomalous meteorite. These types of meteorites only account for 0.2% of all known meteorites that very closely matches the isotope ratios of Earth and the Moon, but not close enough to pin an origin on it in the Earth-Moon system. It simply formed nearby in the solar nebula, meaning that it may be a piece of Thea. We just don't know. Number 4. Quantum Mechanics May Get Even Stranger This is strange and potentially scientifically very important. Anyone familiar with this channel knows of quantum entanglement where two particles, even when separated by huge distances, remain linked. A new study, however, seems to suggest that there is a limit to this, that at a certain point, quantum correlations stop and something else begins, something we do not understand. To determine if objects are quantum entangled, physicists use a test called the Bell Tests that repeatedly measure the system to create a probability distribution to try to figure out how likely the system is to be in any one state. Complicated, but it works. Except that there are outliers. New work has calculated and constrained just what probability distributions are allowed in quantum theory, and it turns out that any that don't match must belong to some kind of underlying, exotic to us, theory beyond quantum mechanics that we do not yet have. This really comes down to an open question. Is there something beyond or not? If not, then this work is somehow not right. But if so, this could have revolutionary effects on things like quantum computing and our understanding of physics below the atom. Number 3. The Mysterious Red Dots at the Beginning of the Universe one of the weird finds by the James Webb Space Telescope since its launch has been the discovery of hundreds of objects populating the early universe that appear as extremely compact red dots. These objects persist for much of the first billion years after the Big Bang, but then vanish, suggesting that they are a product of something that happened early on in the universe but has since stopped. One idea for these is that they were the progenitors of galaxies somehow, but that fit none of the models of early galaxy evolution. Recent work at MIT, however, may shed some light on this in that it seems possible that the red dots are actually very early supermassive black holes that are shrouded in extremely dense gas, so dense that it's on the level with the outer atmosphere of a star. Naturally, the black holes would be accreting this material, devouring it, causing the gas to glow brightly. This gas would be very tight in, something that could happen that early in the universe, and as the light from this escapes through the envelope, it seemingly would produce the effect of a little red dot in space early in the universe's history. There are alternatives, however, such as the suggestion that it might be a black hole ripping apart a group of relatively early stars. But that seems a bit implausible because you'd need a very large, very densely packed group of stars to fit. Interestingly, this may help answer the long-standing question of how supermassive black holes formed in the first place. Number 2. A Potentially New Class of Earth Life One of the weirdest periods in the history of life on Earth was the period of about 420 to 375 million years ago when the land surface of the Earth was ruled by organisms known as prototaxites, which may have been instrumental in breaking up and starting Earth's soil, paving the way for land plants, and also catching fire and burning, as prototaxites apparently were subject to. These were once thought to be giant fungi, basically 8 meter tall, 1 meter wide proto-mushrooms. And indeed, when they were first discovered in the fossil record in 1843, they were thought to be conifer trees, but are much too early and far too primitive for that. New work at the University of Edinburgh has questioned all of this, and in fact, protexites may not have been a fungus at all, but rather a member of a form of life in this world not seen anywhere else, and currently does not seem to be present here any longer. 
How these organisms grew differs from fungi in structure, and the strata where the group of fossils for the study were found also contained normal members of the fungi group, making for easy chemical comparison, and they were completely different despite the fossilization conditions being identical. One specific difference is that the prototaxites contain no chitin, which is a component of fungal cell walls. But they did contain lignin, which is more like a woody plant. It's possible that the fungal world was much more diverse back then, or it really is a new class of life on Earth. But either way, it seems likely that as plants rose and became trees and shrubs, the prototaxites simply went extinct from the competition. Number 1. Asteroid Bennu is getting stranger In 2023, NASA's OSIRIS-REx spacecraft returned samples from the asteroid Bennu to Earth, and it became apparent that the samples contained numerous chemical building blocks used by life. These included phosphorus and carbon. Also in here was nitrogen, which is a mystery because the concentrations of nitrogen in the samples is actually implausibly high, including a compound containing carbon, oxygen, and nitrogen at a level of 20% nitrogen, which is extremely high for this. What's expected is that carbon compounds can form structures in asteroids known as nanoglobules, which are hollow blobs of carbon that can contain other molecules within them. But with the Bennu samples, the globules were found to form vast structures by sticking together as a kind of macromolecule. Evidence shows that these formed at very cold temperatures during the formation of the Sun and have been there ever since. These structures may have served to protect other important elements for life, and potentially facilitating and allowing for their delivery to Earth and the rest of the solar system, possibly contributing to a biogenesis. But here's where it gets odd. Another team when preparing the samples noticed that they responded very strongly to magnetic fields. They compared this to meteorites, and the globules in meteorites were not magnetic, yet those in Bennu were strongly magnetic. Why this is remains unknown. But it may simply be that the nuclear magnetic resonance study that the samples were being prepared for magnetized them. But this has not happened with any of the meteorites similar to the samples of Bennu. No one knows why this is at this time. Thanks for listening. I am futurist and science fiction author John Michael Godier, currently eyeing the plants suspiciously. For some reason, at least where I am, the garden plants have taken off rather quickly this year. Yet it really didn't do anything different from any other year. You may say good weather and rain, but I say no. They are planning something, and be sure to check out my books at your favorite online book retailer and subscribe to my channel for regular in-depth explorations into the interesting, weird, and unknown aspects of this amazing universe in which we live.